everybody. Savannah Newton here for Black Barn Fine Art Studio. Uh, we have a great interview for you today. I'm super excited. Um, kind of a different type of art than we've been featuring so far in our interviews. We are talking with assemblage artist Steve Parmalee. We're going to ask him some exciting questions about what he's doing, how we got here, and uh, his what he's doing currently with uh, Black Barn. So here he is. Hello, Steve. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Thank you so much for taking time to be here today and to chat with me about stuff. No, I'm glad to. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you. And um, so for uh, people who don't know me very well, because I'm not um, out and about especially not in Washington anymore, but um, I used to get to work with Steve occasionally for shows um, at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts on Bainbridge Island. Um, and I know that you're still like pretty involved with shows and stuff there. And um, it's a great, it's a great yeah. gallery and cause. Yeah, we miss you. <laughs> <laughs> I miss it over there too, all the time. I'm always trying to figure out how I can get back there for a little. Yeah, a workshop maybe. Yeah, yeah that's, um, so I am going to, um, I know I sent you a list of questions before we came here and I kind of had a specific order, but I'm going to mix it up a little bit and keep you on your toes. Go crazy. Go crazy. Um, and so the first one I wanted to ask you about is um, how you got synced up with Black Barn and made this um, step. Like you're, you're very busy. Like I feel like you're doing like at least three shows a month. Um, and so it's interesting to see you now teaching because I know that you would do workshops you've done workshops for um for Bainbridge Arts and Crafts and at right. Barn and everything right. but um this just seems different to have it be like an organized like you are teaching workshops can you tell yeah. us about that yeah no it's 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 neat uh, I haven't done those like one-off workshops for six years or so okay. that Bainbridge Arts and Crafts was the last one I think and then yeah COVID things got weird and stuff and uh um yeah how did how did I get hooked up with Black Barn? I mean, I, I, I go to um, Art in the Woods, the studio tour, and that's where I probably saw Eileen and Derek and and the and the beautiful new uh, space they have. I like the space. I get along with, you know, Eileen and Derek and um, just chatting and, and one thing led to another. Um, Eileen and I, I've known each other for years, just kind of through um, studio tours, but yeah, she's she does... Uh, um, work that I like, and I think she likes my work. So I think it was just a mutual kind of, um, yeah, synergy. Yeah, you guys both have, you have that heavy storytelling factor um, in your work. I've had other people see the similarities, which is a compliment to me, but I I, I get it. She gets into um, a narrative that's very, not complex, but very multi-layered. And I, I love doing that too. So yeah, I can see, I can see it. It's yeah, it's, it's a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> do you feel like um do you feel like teaching kind of uh like feeds your creative process? Like when you're showing someone else how to put things together, does it help you come up with new ideas? Yeah. Uh of course. Yeah, yeah. It's um because I I like to think I I've I think in all different directions and I try to look at it from all different angles, but yeah, then I see someone else and I'm like, wow, that's yeah, that's I never looked at it that way, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I like to teach. Yeah. It's um, I feel like the things that you're doing are so different than like any other, you know, like when you take like an art class, like that's what you do is not at all what someone would necessarily expect to walk into and sign up for. And mm -hmm. so I feel like that's such a um, it's just using your creative brain in such a important but really different way that I'm sure like. It's just exciting, I think, for people to probably see this class offering on a list where it's like, yes, I can do drawing like I need to do drawing. Yes, I can do oil painting. I need to do oil painting. But like, what? What's that? Like there's a base <laughs> on it and like there's like metal pieces and. Yeah. And it's, it's a kind of maybe a head scratcher for some that are used to like drawing, sculpting painting you know and then there's the hell but it's um i uh it also kind of followed my path of becoming an artist because i i didn't feel strong in painting and drawing and sculpting so i never really thought okay i'm not gonna do art until later in life when i discovered this so in a way it um 
and I think maybe for even for other people who are like, I'm not good at, or I haven't put the time in to do a, to be a, a good at the traditional um, media, they'll be like, oh, but I, I could do that. You know, it's it's. I think it's more accessible maybe for some people who are kind of pen and and brush shy, which I was. So yeah, it's. I wouldn't say it's um, it's something kids do, you know. I mean, but they do. You put things together, collage. They've you know done since elementary school, so it's 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 got that same um, uh, feel to it. I think it's like the most advanced version that you could do with that. Uh, accessible, yeah, but still you can, and yeah, thank you. Uh, just the I try to elevate it a little bit, you know, to more. Um, uh in a fine art kind of a way because mm -hmm. it does get kind of a you know stepchild kind of a a sense in a in a, in a academic setting i think um but I, I i've seen and i like pushing that um um into the fine art putting it into museums and and stuff like that helping i mean it not that it doesn't get attention but it's just kind of in the in the back room it's different. Like people are always thinking about oil painters and that kind of thing. And not that that's anything to poo poo, but like it is, um, I think it is so important that the world in general see these like other ways that you can create art and be creative that just isn't in the, like you went to art school and like joined an atelier and. Yeah. I'm not bad mouthing those, those skills that, um, you know, uh, that the other instructors that, black barn have there that's it's great and i'm not um even saying assemblage is that much of a um outsider art although i bet a lot of people put it in that outsider folk art genre mm -hmm. and it can look like that half the time but yeah I, I think it can be if you put the um the thought into it it can absolutely be museum fine art Absolutely. Um, so you've mentioned a couple of times on um, people not feeling like they can do the other kind of art and you kind of grouping yourself in there. Can you like tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are? Because um, I, I, I deep dove a little bit into your background and I just think it's really interesting how you got to where you are as a professional artist. Thanks. Yeah. Uh going back to that not good at art uh, or i didn't think th i mean let me go back to the beginning so <laughs> in college i studied uh design at university of iowa and um some some at rhode island school of design i took a summer um, workshop there and and got into graphic design not i didn't study fine art um i didn't i didn't think that was going to be my path i uh, I didn't make my first piece until I was 40 something in my forties. So it was all kind of building unintentionally skills towards this kind of art. It seems in hindsight it was not planned. Cause I, I probably couldn't say assemblage, let alone know what it was. You know, it just didn't have, it wasn't on my radar. Um, my mom was a, actually an art teacher, an elementary art school teacher. So it's not that we didn't do art around the house. We did a lot, um, but that, yeah, it just wasn't, I didn't gravitate towards that at a young age. So I did graphic design for 10 years, but I also, there's collected things, you know, like people do for no um, good reason. <laughs> and I like to build things even as a kid, you know, um, models or dioramas uh, I'd like building. Um, so somehow before I was 40, I got a lot of um, skills that I use now. So a graphic designer in like a print shop setting uh, uh, where I picked up skills about composition and layout and which come in handy, um, contrast and uh, yeah, all, all the design muscles that you need. I just used every day in not a very artistic, I thought, setting, you know, commercial. Um, but those skills came in handy. Uh, the building stuff really comes in handy. 
how to, especially on challenging things to put together, uh, different ways of attaching things. Um, so I built those skills without thinking about using them for art, but I had those skills. And then the collections, again, kind of just fell into it. Was not planned for assemblage, but by the time I had all this stuff, I was I was loaded. I was ready for um, building these things. Um, I started going to estate sales with a friend. And this is in Denver. Um, so for like 10 years, I had this big loft where I had space to collect junk. I went to these estate sales, partly because I just liked cool old things, mm -hmm. like a lot of people do, but also thinking maybe I could sell them, you know, in a antique store type setting. I thought I had a good eye for things, um, old stuff, and just started collecting. So every weekend I'd be out doing estate sales. During the week I'd be, um, yeah, doing freelance design mainly. Um, and then remodeling stuff too. So, so I had all, all those skills built up and without any idea that I'd be doing assemblage or what it was. And then I was looking, I was in a bookshop looking at um, graphic design books for ideas for a client. And I saw in the same kind of section over there was the uh, a book that kind of changed my whole life. Uh, the It was called The Secret of Rusty Things. <laughs> the title grabbed me because I'm like, I mean, it's a great title, well, but I, like I opened it up. Rusty things. Uh, it was by <laughs> Michael Demeng, who's... I think a Montana guy originally, or he's, he's, he's Northwest now guy, but he, uh, he writes well, he does beautiful work. And I, I got the book, read it cover to cover, uh, just kind of blew my mind. And I thought of, of a few of them, uh, like, Oh, I have some of those. I, you know, the stuff he made, I have some of that. I have some of that. And I could do that. And totally with the idea of just for my wall, I, I had no, intentions of selling them so boy that was in 2011 yeah and so i found this this book um found out he taught workshops too online so i took a workshop in february and then oh no in no you know december january february by february that year i made my first piece uh like a complicated heart um valentine type thing mm -hmm. um and i was pretty proud of it so i, I made uh, some others over those years i made a, about a a dozen that looked a lot like michael demeng's work okay uh i followed his um technique his his um painterly style like if you look at my work now i don't paint on it Mm -hmm. but I did then because he did. So he's, he, he will make a, a, a beautiful piece construction wise out of, you know, three dimensional weird stuff, but he would paint it all white and then go and paint on top of it. Just beautiful patinas or fake rust. You know, it was, it was very cool. Like mythical creatures, not kind of the kind of stuff I do, but I, um, just beautiful. He's a fine art painter. He just happens to do it on three dimensions, which, um, which gave the effect of rusty things, you know, uh, um, old, old stuff, yeah. but I had old stuff. So, um, after a while, my stuff started looking less like his, I, I didn't consciously say, you know what? I don't want to paint on mine. I, I want it to have the original patinas. I want it to have the rust, the, how as found objects. Yeah. Which became challenging. Um, uh, but it just felt more like me because the stuff I was drawn to, I, I just like the crackled paint, you know, the, the stuff that's, and you can, yes, you can fake it, but I just like the real, the real old stuff. I can, yeah. you can kind of pick up whether it's, you know, um, it's imitating it, I think. Mm -hmm. But I, so it just, not that I, um, I felt that they were like knockoffs of Demang's, my first few, 
but they were in, in the sense that I was learning from that. And, and maybe painters do the same thing. They'll take someone they like and do a Van Gogh. And all right, that's an, a Van Gogh knockoff. But I, it got me to the uh, confidence level where I could sort of steer it in towards what I, I liked, which I felt more like an artist than, a, a you know, and copying someone. So mm -hmm. it was, it was trans, uh, gradual. This is the word I'm looking for. It wasn't a sudden shift. Like if you looked at my old work, it's kind of the paint just went away. And all of a sudden I really wince at painting on anything. It's just with self-constraint that I put on myself. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I, you have to, to cover up something, but I, I try not to as much as I can. So my voice, if you will, would, would be um, old, maybe 60, 70 year old stuff that or older um that has its own color palette so it became kind of faded palette there's not a lot of bright colors in my work but um i'm okay with that i i, I like the the look it almost like a sepia tone mm -hmm. on everything it's all either sun faded or just age wear yeah i love um what you're just talking about, about like kind of developing your own style. Like, I feel like that's kind of, you know, it's like what workshops are for. Like you said, like, I don't know if oil painters, do, like, yes. Like, I feel like that's like, you know, we, we go to the workshop and then we're so excited and enamored with what the instructor is doing. And then, so we learn to do it and then we learn to do it right. And then once we learn how to do it right, then that's when you kind of like have that freedom. Like you said, like, then you trusted yourself to be like, okay, like, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm looking at. And now I kind of know what I want. And like just like being able to pull that out, but it is gradual. I think that um, it's tough. Cause I think sometimes when people go into these workshops and things, they, I think that sometimes depending on how much the investment is, they think they might get to come out of it and just be like, I'm an artist now, but that's like not how it works. Cause you have to learn so much about yourself in relation to what you just learned. Yeah. There's, there's definitely patience involved. Yeah. And the, um, your pieces, that's like, um, talking about the way that you pick things out too. I love that you leave it with their original character. Now I didn't realize that about that. I think that you might've had one or two pieces in that first show that, um, that I got to like participate and help set up with you, um, on Bainbridge Island. And I think that there might've been something that was, that was painted on, but I, but I do feel like you honor like the original piece so much. And like, that's, when you go to an estate sale, that's what makes you feel like you found a treasure is when you find it and you can tell that it's really old. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So I love that you don't like take that away from, from the piece. And then also from the person who's looking at it. Cause then it's just like, Oh, this is so cool. It's so old. Like I love antiques. Yeah. And I, and I get people that come in the gallery that are really drawn to antiques and, and, and kind of the where's Waldo. Oh, that's a hammer. And that's a, um, yeah, I love that. And, but, but also then they'll be like, oh, but there is a story here too. Uh, um, uh, it kind of surprises them that it's not just displaying an old cool thing, which is, is cool in a vignette or something on a mantle. And, uh, it's, I do it. Um, but, but to put a story behind it or, uh, yeah, like a narrative, just kind of, or, or a joke or something that kind of uh, is, is funny. Your work is really funny. Like that's like finding like puns and like reading yes, the titles yeah. and everything. Yeah, dad um, jokes. Yep. <laughs> some of my favorite <laughs> things. Um, and then also just also talking about color and like your eye for design too, because I think that that really is key with this is that like you do see a lot of the kind of se sepia tone, you know, throughout, but you're also really good at pops of color. And like you put in like just a little bit of new something in with like the old stuff that just kind of like, takes it it's conscious because i i look back at some that are so brown and so flat that i now i i uh, almost i do look for contrast it's hard because everything um uh, that i'm kind of attracted to is that brown <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah no uh, especially old colors old reds are cooler yeah. than old blues they're not cooler they're more um age appropriate authentic they go with it they match the browns yeah. but um yeah i try to put a little color in it yeah, it's a, it's a challenge 
I'm sure. Well, and because most of the time I feel like the color that you put in, it's not, you're not painting color on something. You have found an object that is bright yeah. that you incorporate with the brown. And I imagine finding old things that still do have bright the color, color to it. Yeah. Is it's, it, it is challenging. And I, and I, I, I love the old um, advertising colorings. The, the packaging is, is usually something that has a little, a little pop of color in it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for noticing that. <laughs> Um, and then I thought that I read in your background that you have a little bit of construction background too. Is yeah. That yeah. Uh, home repair remodel for, yeah, like 10 years. And it didn't apply to me that it would be like for art. Yeah. But all of a sudden I have all these tools that come in handy and all the fasteners. And, and I started, once I started um, knowing I'm doing this kind of art, I started at the estate sales collecting the fasteners out of the the old guy's basement, you know, the, the coffee can full of screws and nuts. So when I, when I, when I show them in the art, they are the same age. They're not the shiny ones from, you know, Home Depot. So yeah, that, that once I started doing it, I, my state sales shopping changed a lot. I started looking for chain or old wire for attaching again, just to keep it in the same age. And, and that I would never collect. And that when I bring up to the counter to pay for it, people are like, you really want that junk? You know, that's, that's yeah. they probably would have thrown it out. Um, yeah, you're probably a blessing to them because they probably have those canisters <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, like here's the fine china and like, here's, you know, like the old, like the Pyrex and here's, and like, okay, here we go. And then you're like, hey, can I look in your garage? <laughs> yeah, yeah, or in the shed or the barn. Or the basement. Um, that's where the cool stuff is. Like all these antique dealers will scatter towards the, you know, the good stuff. And I'll be um, getting a, a box of crap that, um, yes, they probably think I'm weird, but that's all right. And and I get a discount because if I get a, a whole bunch of crap on in a box, they don't want to price it out. So, yeah, yeah, I'm sure they're just happy to have it gone. So they'll they just shake it. their head and say, here, yeah, <laughs> just, just please just take it. Just take it. <laughs> Um, so you're with your construction background, like, I feel like that probably has helped you a lot with knowing how to attach some of your stuff is really heavy. So like knowing like how to attach some of your more fragile things with your more heavy things, like making sure that it's all like structurally sound. I feel like that probably came into play a lot with your training in that. Yeah. I, I, I taught a, a workshop, I think it was last weekend at barn. And I, I kind of asked what people were looking for to get out of the class. Um, and it was it was a, a good mix, as you can imagine. But a lot of people wanted to know those kind of construction techniques. You know, the, um, they've done this, but they they realize that they they don't know how to attach those two things or the best way. They probably have a hot glue gun, but it's probably not your best. That, yeah. So so I try to talk about all of that because there's so many different things: metal to glass or wood to um, fiber. Yeah, it's so yeah, that's the kind of stuff I like to teach. But yeah. there was also the people who just kind of wanted to get inside my um, process, my thought process on pieces and where I come up with some of the um, combinations or titles or, or um, yeah, just kind of the thought process, the thought process people and then the technical, how do you do this kind of a thing. It was yeah. a good mix, it was a good mix. It's, I'm sure it's a lot easier to teach the, um, the physical, how do things attach part versus the, you know, like, it's kind of like trying to teach someone how to be funny. <laughs> yes and no. I mean, there is a, um, I, I give some, some process things to, uh, what I do. It doesn't just, it doesn't come off always. I mean, sometimes I'll find a piece and I'll be like, oh, that's funny. Oh, if I did that and easy. But uh, other times, there's really um, kind of going in and exploring a concept without any any stuff, but just really kind of thinking it, um, using some techniques that anyone can do, but maybe don't think about it when they're um, they're just thinking, oh, it's supposed to just come to me. But no, there's there's some tricks I use and and uh, exercises maybe. So sometimes you're thinking more about what you want to say versus having the pieces tell you what yeah. they want to say. Yeah. 
half the time it's that and half the time it's it's the, the thing and people always ask that too do you come to the idea first or the and it's half and half sometimes it's just a cool thing and i have to make something with it and sometimes i want to tell this story how could i do it with stuff instead of painting without spelling it out just doing it like a almost like a set maybe mm -hmm. can you um can you tell us a little bit about your studio and how that kind of like lends itself to you like coming up yeah with i i i lament that it's small it's a one car garage i'm in it now um it's 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 full it's tight and that I, I don't I wish I always wish I had more space. I'm sure everyone in, in my business says I wish I had more space. Um, but it also in a indirect way helps uh, sometimes put things together. Like when I'm disorganized and there's piles, sometimes I'll see two things together that I never would have thought of. And it either is amusing or it's just it fits it fits so well the um, that I wouldn't have, if I had it all organized, I wouldn't have those things together. So a messy desk sometimes for me, uh, I'll get an idea. I love that. Or sometimes you get it. too many ideas and you can't, you're working on something else and you get distracted. And then that thing, yeah, no, I, I, I go through a lot of um, ADD kind of. That's usually my problem. But, <laughs> but hearing you say that actually just makes me think of, um, like seeing, um, you know, you, you talked about how this is kind of something that kids do. And it's like when um, when my kids want to start working on something, they don't go like, oh, OK, I'm going to build a Lego house. And so I'm going to look in this box and I'm going to pick out a window and I'm going to pick out this. They take the thing and they go dump and then they just like see what looks next to each other and then they start yeah. putting it together. And I feel like that um, I, you know, talking to you about it, I'm just like, oh, that's just that's just a creative process. That's not my four-year-old making a giant mess. They're just <laughs> tapping in. <laughs> a mess, a mess helps. No, I know it's a, it's yeah, it's, um, it's a fine line though. It can get out of hand. And then I got to just, I got to clean and organize and sort. And that's another one of my disorders besides hoarding is <laughs> sorting and organizing. Um, and dur during that process, that's when I find some cool things too that I forgot I had or, that I have like a piece going that I, I put on hold that um, I'll get back to because I found something that's good for it. Mm -hmm. So the sorting, the organizing um, periodically helps solve some design problems that I was having on other things. Yeah, no, it's, it's a cycle. Make a mess, put it away. Make a mess, put it away. It's kind of a ebb and flow. Yeah, I didn't think of that. I don't know the timing of it. Sometimes it's a year, <laughs> but... But sometimes it's a few months. Yeah. And then you see everything again because you see it. Yes. Like in and I have workspace and I can work on a bigger piece than just how big a space on my desk I have. Yeah. So um, does that affect like how you decide when you're making a big piece versus when you make like your ornaments? Yes, totally. Um, yeah, I, I can I can go outside and work on a really big piece, but the size of my um Workbench is a desk, an oversized desk. So that's why you see a lot of my pieces are that size probably. But but I just gravitate towards that that size. I know people who love the big yard art out of the same things, welding. And I just, again, my voice is a certain size. I love wall hangings too. I don't know if you noticed. A lot of my people like to do pedestal pieces. Mm -hmm. I don't know if... You, you see other artists that do this they they don't do a lot of wall pieces unless they're shadow boxes or um collections of things you know that kind of thing but yeah I, again and back to construction hanging things is sometimes a challenge yeah Heavy things but also um yeah just things that are so dis different in material it's just uh it's kind of hard to hang on the wall. And I think that impresses some people that, you know, that you made that and it's it's holding together and it's not on a table. Yeah. Like getting that table stuff to go up there and, and make it last is, is a challenge I like to play with.
Yeah, that's my, that's what I was thinking when I was talking about uh, things being really heavy that you work with and then working with things that are like kind of light and just making sure that, yeah, it's structurally sound when gravity, you know, there's nothing to support the gravity. Like the, it's just the piece, like holding on to each other and, yeah. you know, like trusting that it's going to, you know, be fine up there. And to add trust, sometimes I, I like showing the fasteners as part of the design. They're not behind it and hidden. You'll be like, that is holding up that and that's cool and i i love that i um when i can do that even if i could do it and hide the fasteners if i can do it from the front and make it a design element i think i think that's a little hidden thing that people don't maybe notice but that, that they like yeah without putting their finger on it to be like oh, okay but the construction engineer type people they they, they're like, oh, that's cool. That's neat. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever have to go and hang stuff for your customers? Occasionally. Um, it's a good question. When I do a, a, like a, um, a jury show, sometimes you have to hand it off. And I, uh, I feel bad for some of them. <laughs> I, I give good layout. I mean, it doesn't happen. I'm making it sound worse than it is. But sometimes it needs a, a cleat or or two screws, one here and one here. So I make a little template so they can do that. But yeah, I like to keep them on their toes. The yeah, I'm thinking about my my old house. We have like the old like cement, like uh, I don't know, they're like plaster walls. They're not yeah. they're not great for hanging things. Yeah. And so I think about um, if I wanted to hang something, like how how would I go about doing that? Or would I just ask Steve to come over? and help me make sure yeah. that it's on there. Yeah. It's not going to come no, back. That's, I, I love those challenges. I don't like cement walls, but I like the, the challenge of how you can hang that. Because there's a lot of ways, and actually that's not a plug my next class, but there's a lot of that. How do you hang this? How, how do you put this together? And yeah, that's the next workshop is kind of looking at really challenging things and coming up. There's solutions out there. There's off the shelf things at you know home depot but there's also changing the design a little um adding something sometimes if it's really hard maybe it's saying that you need to add something to the to the back design wise as a support and it also acts as a design element um, yeah that was actually going to be uh, my next question was just how because i know that you just had your one day class that had right. a great turnout and um yeah. if anyone who's watching wants to see we actually have pictures of everyone's finished projects on facebook and i and yeah. maybe on the website um which was just cool seeing what everyone like i feel like everyone came out like with really cool pieces and stuff yeah yeah um, and they had a good time too um and i think achieved more than they thought they would maybe in a day mm -hmm. i was impressed yeah yeah, like it was like finished pieces walking out the door for the yeah, most part. It was, like that's it was a really, really cool. good crowd. Yeah. And so I was going to ask what the difference is between um, this the one day class and then the two day class, because based on how it's described, I've, I've heard um, people in general, I think people get a little bit intimidated by multi day classes because they're like, oh, like if someone's going into the like, I'm I'm not a professional. And so I'm not going to go to the multi day. I'm just going to go to the dip my toe. Yeah. In and um so just uh i'd love to know like kind of the difference in how you structure your two-day class versus your one-day class all right uh the one day one was a valentine i thought any skill level come in we can make something um and you, even if you don't want to be an assemblage artist you know take the class get to hang out uh create something uh pick up some skills i think especially because uh, the person next to you is doing something and you're like, I mean, even if you're not doing that technique, you'd be like, okay, I, I can pick that up. The next one I was thinking would be more hands. Um, not that that wasn't hands on, but more where everybody learns these techniques, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's doing this, 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 you know, ABC. And even if it's not a, um, an art piece, like in the last one where you could give to someone, you'd have a piece that has all the techniques that you're going to need to um, that I can, you know, disseminate in two days that could make something else. So I, I, I don't know if it's, I'm not going to say it's not geared towards a beginner. It is, but maybe it's not geared towards someone that just wants to make 
something once and never do it again. So it's kind of a, it's totally a skill builder. I don't know if that um, is and techniques and makes you comfortable with certain tools that maybe you wouldn't have been normally. So I, I, it's kind of a immersive. Um, I don't want to intimidate them. There's not heavy duty tools, you know, drills and, and, and grinders mm -hmm. and you don't have to, but it's, it's a technique. And I think it's even called techniques and tools or something yeah. like that. But yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I don't want um, people to be intimidated, but you're going to do a lot of different things that maybe you haven't done before. Yeah. I would say it, it almost seems like it's almost more for beginners just because um, I mean, the first one, you know, everyone did leave with a finished piece, but like, because of it being more for fun, there's a little bit more trust in yourself doing the process the best you can. And then just hoping for the best when you get it home, that it is going to, you know, hold up based on what you learned that day. Yeah. And this next one, I feel like, um, if you haven't used, ever used a drill before or a grinder or whatever, this is kind of like a, just stepping a little bit out of your comfort zone. Like yeah. you're not going to expect people to be an expert on using that thing. Cause that's why you're teaching them how to use the thing. So it's kind of like, it's almost more beginner giving them the foundations to actually create the thing before yeah. they're creating the thing. Right. Uh, the last one, I think a lot of people came in and got to choose what they wanted to make. So they chose things I think they were comfortable putting together just subconsciously. They're like, I, okay, I know how to do that. So I'm going to, I'm going to pick these things. Whereas if I force them to do something, maybe they wouldn't normally do not force them. You know, if we all doing the same thing, one of the favorite things that I, that I noticed that everyone really liked was working with a two part epoxy clay in my last workshop, none of them had, and I made them all at least play with it. And they all said that was one of the best parts there was, was just um, getting that hands-on that they wouldn't have done on their own. It's a little intimidating, but we all did it together. And they, um, yeah, that was a memorable part. And I'm going to do that again. It, it's just uh, comfort zones. I think people want to stay in their comfort zone and, and it's a little, I just want to push them out of that. Even if it doesn't look great or you screw up, you, you tried it. Yeah. Kind of and having those, even if it doesn't necessarily come out to be like the most beautiful piece, like in that two day period, because of it being foundational to so many other things. Um, like you even talking about the epoxy. Clay, I have actually had epoxy clay on my like wish list of things to like buy for myself for like, for like almost 10 years, I think. <laughs> and it's because it's intimidating, but people, but because it can be used for such cool things. And um, the thing that I wanted to use it for is not assemblage. I guess it's kind of assemblage, but in kind of a weird, gross way. But anyway, um, I, at a frame shop that I worked at, um, my boss had this uh, beaver skull sitting on top of a stereo. And one day when I was bringing a heavy frame by, I accidentally bumped into the stereo and I knocked this beaver skull onto the floor. And so oh, it was, did you lose a tooth. No. It, it, uh, it lost half a tooth. And then like part of the, like the front part of the skull, like came off from the back part of the skull, but like the bottom was fine, but it was like the top that got messed up. And, um, she was like, well, like, I don't really know what to do with this now. And I was like, I will take it. I don't know what I will do with it, but I will take it. And, um, so that was, someone was like, get epoxy clay and you can put it back together and you can kind of like fill it in and like make it work with epoxy yeah, i'm like i'm gonna yeah. do that i still have this little skull just like in my studio in like a little paper because i still haven't put for it 10 in. years yes no i've i feel yeah i'm the same it's, Neat. It's those, well, yeah so stuff like that epoxy clay yeah like it's just things that um that it, once once that uh once the band-aids ripped off and you're not afraid of uh you know using that material anymore and putting things yeah. together then like, even if they're not going to go and be, you know, a Steve Parmalee uh, protege, they might like have something else that they like to do. That's going to fix a skull, a beaver skull, like for instance, you know, no, honestly, they, after they did it, I, I think they're all super comfortable with it. They're like, okay, that's not so bad. And they're like, oh, I could fix something in my house with it. I, I use it at work all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um... yeah. So like that, I, I'm not saying we're not going to create anything beautiful. We might. I mean, uh, we will, let's just say, but, but it'll be kind of, I think everyone's going to do the same basic layout, but it's yeah. going to have their own personality to it, but we're all going to kind of go through the same kind of steps of building something together. We're all doing the same technique, 
but in your own style, your own, if it's whimsical or dark, they can do their own kind of thing. So it's, it's not uncreative, this next one. Like the last one was basically play kind of creative, but this one will be a little more structured, I think, as far as technique. That's all. It'll still be beautiful. Yeah, it's all going to be beautiful. That's, <laughs> I'm excited to see what the next ones come through because, um, because yeah. Um, so assemblage tools and techniques is May fourth and fifth, right? And so that's going to be fun too because that's also um, I feel like people are like heavily into like interior design mode that time of year, like spring cleaning, like, and kind of what you do is like small scale interior design like you're you're taking like your graphic design and you're taking your like construction like home and like yeah yeah uh curating like you're curating yeah. your home a little bit when you're putting a piece together you're making so many decisions on what to include and what not to um and it's all personal preference yeah so just like your home um there's a lot of that vibe when I'm when I'm collecting things for a piece, it's it's totally curating, and then kind of uh, what goes well together, you know. Especially in a house, like you've got maybe this color is too matchy, or uh, or you need a you need a different uh, material. Yes, this is getting very metal, cold. I need something warmer, wood or or fabric in here. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Never thought of that. And something that just I hadn't really thought of either um, with your workshops, because, of course, you know, like when we're when we're learning from you in a class, we're going to try and do things as closely to the way that you're doing it. Like like the person that you learned from, like when you're learning, you're kind of trying to do it similar to them. But as these people, like if they decide they like it and they want to continue doing that when they're going out and they're curating things from their own estate sales and everything that they yeah. find, they are going to have a totally different kind of like subset of things and tones and like subject matter that they go for. So even though it'll be like the things that you're making, like, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see like, you know, these Steve Parmalee pro proteges going out in the world and making things. Cause it'll be like, I'm sure that it'll be obvious to see your hand in it, but like seeing other people's personality. And totally. Taste. And when you see the Valentines from the last, um, the last workshop, the variety and the different voices and play, yeah, this it has so much legs. Even the stuff I brought was very Parmalee stuff, mm -hmm. but there's a whole world of, of more recent things, plastics and uh, bright colors of found objects, stuff stuff that wasn't intended for art, but I'm gonna make art out of it, uh, and that's that's fun. And I have no. Um, concern that it's going to look too parm too many parmleys out there, because everyone has their own own voice to bring to it, their own stuff, their own sensibilities about color and things and materials. Uh, I have a friend Diane Haddon who does. You, you probably remember from all the um, BAC even in, in studio tours. We like the same stuff. Even we like the same age stuff, but I can totally tell the difference between our work. There's mm -hmm. almost, there's nothing that's like a confusing, is that a, a Haddon or a Parmley? There's, there's just some like inner spirit coming out that she's got just a little more uh, lighter, whimsy, maybe mine's a little darker or a little twisted, um, but mm -hmm. same things even, and they're not the same. The first just... show that I got to do uh, with you and like help like set up and everything was actually it was uh, it was you and Diane Haddon. It was a dual show. And um, and yeah, I do remember that your pieces went so well together. And yeah, just like you said, like it was very clear whose whose was whose, but they just worked so well together in yeah. the room and like kind of it had the same undertone, like the same kind of. Um, vibe i don't know it, it was like it was like a similar voice but it was like um you know like brother and sister not yeah. the same person yeah not identical twins and uh the same vintage where mm -hmm. the, the stuff we're attracted to so we go to sales together but we rarely fight over the same things it's interesting you'd think yes it's uh actually when i got started i i stalked her she was doing it first. So I would go to um, studio tours and kind of, you know, get, try and 
talk to her or listen in, eavesdrop to see what she was like. And <laughs> um, turns out now we're we're great friends. Um, and she's yeah, she's, um, kind of a heroish kind of thing, a mentor that's become a peer, which is which is nice. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I and I do feel like um, you've had that same kind of like spirit just in what bit I've worked with you and then now seeing you teaching where it's like you're not really like proprietary or like, you know, like close about the things that you work on. Like you are very generous with like the information and the tools and like very encouraging and just wanting to like share this medium with anyone who's, you know, wanting to jump into it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I was intimidated when I was, went around stalking people that they would be like that. Mm -hmm. Like they wouldn't, if I said that I was thinking about that, they, they, they would be like, oh, there's no room for you in the market. <laughs> Total opposite. Very generous, uh, encouraging. Um, there wasn't that protective vibe and I don't have that at all. And the instructor I learned from Michael Demang, that, that guy, completely unworried about people being better than him. It was a little cockiness about him that, sure, copy me. Yeah. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> and I've got that. I've got that. I've got a little of that. I And with my teaching, I, I, I was going to be me. Yeah. Not because I'm that. I am. I'm good at where, where I'm my niche is, but they're going to go in a different way. Or it's always going to feel like a parmly knockoff. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they'll enjoy that or pursue that. They will, I know they'll find their own voice. I, I like to think of myself as as generous as the other people who helped me along and not protective of any techniques. I'm not, uh, I'm not hiding any secrets. And I find very few artists that do that. It seems like a very, um, if you're confident in what you do, you're not, you're not worried about teaching and yeah and with this media i mentioned it kind of being a stepchildish kind of a thing it's very um evan evangelical mm -hmm. i kind of want more people interested in it doing it appreciating it um so all these other uh, artists that aren't going to be that at least they'll, they'll be like okay i have an uh, appreciation of that as an art a fine art form yeah so, yeah yeah i'll more go big, preach more <laughs> Big shows on assemblage. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, and I just, I do like back to kind of earlier part in our conversation. I just do think that that's so important that like the way that you can reach people that um, like, obviously you've been a creative from the beginning, but maybe like the way that you've talked about even your graphic design, like you didn't realize that you were a creative in the beginning, like yeah. some way. And I think it's just like, it's one of those things that like everybody in the world should be creating something but like people don't think that they're worthy of creating something. And so something like this is just like, I feel like a, a it's gonna, it can help people dip their toe in who only see themselves as analytical or only see themselves as, you know, like, oh, I just, I just build stuff so that it's functional, but it's like, you like everybody has that in them and they like need to be able to like be creative sometimes. And so I'm, I'm excited that this is being, that you're offering this at like several locations and like, encouraging people to try this thing, even if it's not like, doesn't matter if you can draw a portrait, like, like use your brain and like, let yourself do this. If I can um, promote you back, I watched your James uh, Andrews interview the uh, month ago or so, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about. And his, he's an elementary, middle school, high school teacher now. Uh, and he was talking about how at a certain age, you're either an artist or you're not, um, that you can, and he was, I love what he said about a technique. You know, you, anybody can learn the techniques. And there's so many people that say, I can't do art. I, was, I didn't say that consciously, but I, I was like, I'm not a fine artist. I don't, what I was probably really saying is I don't want to put in those 10,000 hours to get to be one. Um, and, and I loved what he uh, had to say about um, knocking that out of kids' heads that they're not, they don't, someone told them along the way or they told themselves, I'm not, a, I can't do art. 
And I'm, I'm here to say, you don't have to paint or draw or sculpt. Get some stuff and put it together. Uh, and um, or there's probably even other things, you know, writing, music, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Totally. Just don't, yeah, don't say I'm not an artist. Uh, everyone in my last workshop came out with something they were really proud of. And I think maybe gave them that little boost that I don't have to, um, yeah, paint or draw like, you know, Eileen or Derek or um, mm -hmm. I could if I want to put in the time they did. Yeah, but there's also other forms that are just, that can be just as um, beautiful and kind of moving or meaningful as those people's works. Yeah. yeah, we don't have to keep it in this box. We and he's all... my son's teacher right now. He's Oh, really? <laughs> Sam's in his class. Yeah. It's oh, kind I of small love that. Yeah. He loves it. His 3D design. Yeah, he's he's digging it. They're um sculpting, doing soap sculptures now. Animals. Oh, okay. Yeah, the he was the the subject matter that he was talking about. I'm like, man, that's more than we ever covered in my high school class. Yeah, he is Sam's real lucky to have him. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, now that you brought up your family, I'm, I, uh, I, I have to ask, uh, the, the gingerbread houses that your family does at Christmas time, yeah. like how did that become a tradition? Cause I have shown everybody the ferry boat. Wow. That's great. Yeah. That's totally my yeah side thing. And, and it's just, it's kind of just a group project we like to do together. That's, that's just grown and we've gotten more advanced, but it just started with my mom. We just, your basic gingerbread, but kind of had to, you know, make it bigger. And then it just grew and just from techniques, but thanks. Yeah. We've done some challenging ones and I, and it's a family thing, decorating it. And I have fun with the engineering beforehand, the construction, the, the pieces. Um, but yeah, no, it's, thank you. That's fun. That's, I just, I saw um, like the, the text of the post was something like the annual gingerbread house, whatever. And then you scroll down and then I'm like seeing like curved walls and like car ramps and like, like every, like it was a whole dang ferry boat. And I was like, of course, this is Steve Carmody's <laughs> family gingerbread house that they put together. <laughs> like Thank you. All right. Good PR. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'll make a living at that, but no, there's a, I did one at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts, a little workshop um, last year. You missed it. I know you were gone, but it was kind of fun. That was on building gingerbread houses? Yeah. That was just a one day kind of a little uh, um, thing. So. That's amazing. I would so take that because, yeah, <laughs> our gingerbread houses, that's oh, it's, no, it's, it's fun. Even the disasters look kind of cool if you cover up enough things. <laughs> to get creative <laughs> with it. <laughs> An assemblage artist would say that. Yes, no. <laughs> all all um all the little broken pieces, the broken plates, the everything has um a place in art, in this kind of art. I prefer a chipped plate, you know, I prefer something broken at the estate sale. All the antique dealers are like, yeah, no, and I'm like, yeah. I'll just... <laughs> Just give that right over here. It's got a story. It's got how it got that little chip, you know, or or that toy that's all dented. Somebody had a ball with that, or yeah, it's it's all the the those tools with the um, just completely hand worn, you know. I think how many things were built with that thing. Um, so yeah, the broken is good. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, to wrap up, can you give me a piece of advice that you would give your younger self when you were just starting out in this and like figuring out kind of what you wanted to do? Yeah. Oh, uh, boy. Well, I didn't have this because of my age, but I would say get on YouTube and look for something Go down rabbit holes of things you're interested in, and you may find something that you love. Like like the book I found on the shelf about assemblage art. I, I don't know. I, I think now you can you can go down all these different avenues of things you like and then find out what what it is you like about it. You know, because sometimes you don't consciously think, oh, I love that, but why? 
-hmm. And maybe I'm drawn to, towards that, even if it's not assemblage. There's so many good people out there that are generous with how to do it. Um, I, yeah, I guess I would say also to go talk to those people because I was kind of introverted. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to go talk to those people, but I would tell myself that they're nice. They're going to be generous. They're going to, and I didn't know that about artists, you know, I thought, oh, maybe they're a little too uh, full of themselves or protective, but no, uh, I would say go stalk people and you're at studio tours at galleries. Just go, go say hi. I, 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 yeah, I wish I had been more like that. Just approach people. Some people are, do it effortlessly, but I would say search them out. They could be a mentor. They might not, but they could be a mentor and then eventually a peer and a friend. Um, yeah, I would, I would say, Steve, get out there. Go talk to folks. I think that's been my favorite part about getting to work kind of on the back end of things like with the gallery on Bainbridge and then like helping Eileen and Derek is um, just seeing how much like artists just want to share, like, like everybody just wants to be able to share what they do and what they know. And so that other people, like you said, like, it's kind of evangelical, like, like we just want everyone to be in art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's something about passing things along, passing things on too. It's, it's nice. It's nice. I, I like it. So I'm back to teaching. So I, I'm happy, excited. Okay. Post COVID, we're back at it. Like people are humans again. It's great. Right. And I think there's a few more spots left in my next class in May. So I think there are. Yeah. So again, if anyone's, uh, if anyone's watching, <laughs> sign up. <laughs> it's May 4th and 5th. Right. And yeah, tools and techniques. Um, and you can see it on the website. And then I'm sure that we'll have it in the video description and everything as well, um, a link to it so folks can get to it. But um, but yeah, yeah. getting if anyone has any questions, they could they could contact me about it or, or intimidated um and yeah go look for those peers if it's me buy me a cup of coffee or and we'll we'll talk about it and you got plenty of places to get coffee over there <laughs> yes. the no, I, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about assemblage i i could talk all day awesome i love it well, thank you, Steve, for being with us yeah. today this afternoon. And um, again, the classes uh, May 4th and 5th. And I'm sure that we'll have more offerings from Steve in the future if it does get filled up. For sure. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, we'll be seeing you at the next one. Cool. Good seeing you. Bye.